Yesterday, it was interesting, we, uh, they, we talked and uh, we, were, we were supposed to have Dr. Cooperstein do a little um, um, talk about uh, a, let's see if I'm getting it, patient research, a practice-based research, okay? And I, I did this in the midst of a busy day, this research. We had a lot of presentations yesterday of really interesting cases, which I think are case, single case uh, papers, or uh, there's a lot to learn from. What, was, what, what were the ingredients of a successful case? But uh, practice-based research, I think, is, is what we're trying to create. I, I think that's what Charles is trying to create. And that's why I've been with this program. I think I got 14 papers in over the years. Please. Yeah. Uh, that's, what I, that's why I participate in this, because I believe in it, and I believe in Charles, by the way. Not because he went to the same high school, either. <laughs> anyway, we did this sort uh, the effects of anterior thoracic adjustment on cervical forward flexion, a retrospective case study of 24 patients. Okay. The study criteria was they had limitations of cervical forward flexion. They pre previously received an anterior thoracic adjustment. Okay. They had not been adjusted within two weeks of this study. No acute pain. And they had anterior thoracic findings at T7 and 8 or T8 9. And they had what what the Dr. Giorgiani used to call Pottinger's saucer, a flattening of the apex of the thoracic spine. Uh, there was, of the 24, by the way, I should mention, 21 women, three males, one person who I, uh, who I deemed had scoliosis. Uh, we'll get to him in a second. This is a picture that Charles put in here, which I appreciate. I do it a little differently, and I'm going to just show you talk to you about it, but you get the idea. Patients sitting on the table with their arms crossed in the opposite shoulders, legs down the length of the table. Patient's head is in maximum cervical forward flexion throughout the adjustment. I don't let him bring the chin up. Doctor stationed at the patient's right with his left hand cupped under the designated inner spinous space. Doctor right hand on the patient's shoulder as they were lowered onto the left hand so that the thrust comes part with the hand, but mostly with the shoulder. Uh, I like adjusting like that. Um, it's not the only way I adjust the anterior thoracic vertebra or the, adjust the thoracic spine. So what we did is we took a week in our practice, and every day, we were in there four days, every day we took uh, about six people that were doing anterior adjustments on and measured them with a goniometer in ear to tip of the nose in a, nor in a stationary position and noted their change. Uh, we did ask them these questions, but they're very leading questions. Obviously, does this feel tight? All 24 answered yes. Does this motion feel any different or less tight, I said. And of course, they all answered yes, but we, we really weren't focused on you know, um, uh, getting, the, getting this as a, as a subjective response, but trying to get an objective response. So we measured them after why, afterwards, and this is what we came up with. We had some really good changes of somewhere to 11 to 15 degrees of improvement on nine of them. Nobody in this study was acute. Nobody had just come in, they all, you know, saying my neck hurts. Uh, there was no report of any kind of neck pain but they, they had a previous history and they had been adjusted. I didn't want to acute, acute patients because I think it can, uh, I think it, it can def, uh, de, you know, sort of uh, change what you're trying to, to accomplish here, which is to see what effects it could have. And sometimes on acute patients, it can have a really good effect, sometimes not such a good effect because there might be muscle, muscle um, uh, splinting occurring. But anyway, the changes came along, it was really good. The one person we didn't have a change was the one gentleman who had scoliosis. And uh, actually he's done really well, but he doesn't, he, his, his degree of change was uh, negligible or no, no degree of change 
after that adjustment. Everybody else had some change with most people between 11 to 15 degrees. Uh, this was a study that actually there's uh, this study and another study, both by Cleveland that was put in, where he took 140 patients with neck pain, contrasting the outcomes of exercise only group number one with manipulation, thoracic spine plus exercise group. That data on disability and pain were collected one week, four weeks, and six weeks. Group two exhibited significant greater improvement in disability at both the short and long term, followed up periods, and in pain at one week follow up. So uh, this was the closest I could find. I don't have the resources that Charles knows, but these are the, this was a study that I liked because they used a similar type of adjustment. And it came out, obviously, to support the conclusions that I'm trying to draw. But uh, it's a good study. You know, sometimes I, you, know, you, you look at situations, and the, sometimes the world seems upside down. Here's medical. Soda holes, their best flexion test they have, orthopedic test. Uh, and if pain is elicited, it's a whole grab bag of possibilities. And, and you're still in the diagnosing world over here in medical. And you've already, if you see CFF, if it's functionally limited, you've already done something to improve it, to uh, get it to work better, while in the medical world, you're still trying to figure out, am I making sense here? You know what I'm saying? It's like you've already done something to help them as a chiropractor help them function better, and they're still trying to figure out a diagnosis. All right. A conclusion, the CFF appears to be a helpful method, cervical forward flexion appears to be a helpful method to monitor the functional improvement of the cervical spine before and after a successful ATA. So two, two comments here in closing. One is I think it's a really valuable adjustment. And number two is, I think these kinds of studies uh, can be done and can be really uh, done in your office and can really be helpful. We did a study a couple years ago uh, that uh, involved the same, same kind of form. Actually, I, I, I set this up similar to what, the way I set that up, where we did a straight leg raise, got him up immediately, did a sitting disc technique, got them back, and rechecked their straight leg raise. And there was, there was um, pretty significant and pretty Im impressive improvement. And I now use straight leg raise as very di diagnostic of uh, lack of lumbar flexion, because that's what the sitting disc technique does. It improves, which is a, a DeJarna technique, by the way, uh, sitting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mm-hmm.